Hi, everyone. This is Jason Birak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast. Today, John Manfreda and I are joined by Ryan Fletcher, who is, uh, who is in the corporate development and a director of Zim2 Capital. He is joining us from Vancouver, and we're very happy to have him on the phone. And Ryan is going to give our listeners a very nice rundown of the graphite market. So thank you for joining us here today, Ryan. Thank you, Jay. Hey, Ryan. I was just wondering, to start off, uh, not many retail investors are familiar with graphite. I was wondering if you would just uh, tell our audience what type of uses it has and uh, why uh, investment for dem- for graphite seems to be increasing. Yeah. yeah. In general right now, there is not really a lot of understanding for the space, but over the last couple of years, investors have become familiar with a lot of the other minor or industrial commodities like uh, lithium or manganese or um, vanadium. Um, But graphite has kind of flown a little bit under the radar, even though it's critical to a lot of the same applications. And graphite, you know, a lot of people, when they think of it, they'll think of uh, golf clubs or uh, hockey sticks or uh, maybe even pencils, but um, those are all applications. But the main industries or the main um, spaces where, where where it's being used in is in automotive and things like uh, clutches and and, and brakes. Um, also, the the steel industry uses it a lot as a carbon additive or um, um, in, in crucibles, uh, where it, um, it's used because it's very heat resistant. But um, there's a whole bunch of new demand coming for the commodity or that. Um, people projecting are, are coming for the commodity and, and one of the main applications where that demand is going to come from is from the lithium ion battery which is um, a lot of people um, project is going to be the battery that will drive it already is well and will drive electric cars and smaller electric um, vehicles and so forth and um, people are sometimes surprised when they hear that you need about 20 times 20 times depending on how you calculate it, um, more graphite in a lithium battery than you do need uh, lithium. Now, uh, Ryan, um, we had a little break up there. Did did you say 10 to 20 times more graphite in a lithium ion battery uh, than actual lithium? Yeah. Uh, there are basically there are two parts to a, to a battery, two main parts. There's the anode and the cathode. And in the lithium-ion battery, the the lithium carbonate is the um, is the cat, and the anode is is graphite or flake graphite. Um, so you have a lot of companies, you have a lot of investors, you have a lot of bankers chasing after the lithium market. When there's, in in my opinion, there's maybe you know 20 times more opportunity in the graphite space just on that one application alone. Yeah, and I, I don't really like the supply-demand fundamentals for lithium. Um, I mean, I did research on the different battery types, and you have the vanadium redox flow battery, you have the zinc air battery, which is still in testing in the lab, and then you have the lithium ion battery, which actually has commercial applications, like you said, in the hybrid electric vehicles and the full electric vehicles. And I just see the lithium ion battery, which is really a graphite battery. It shouldn't be called the lithium ion battery because there's more graphite in it, a lot more graphite in it than lithium. And I see that as the real driver for the graphite market going forward. Yeah, I, well, I think there there's opportunity in um, any green metal, I guess you would call it, or a green energy metal. And um, a, energy is an important thing. But, um, oil is a big market, but gradually... Um, you know, people are projecting that more and more a portion of our energy needs is going to come from uh, uh, or alternative means, and a lot of those applications are um, going to draw on graphite. Not only not only the lithium-ion battery, but it's used in the solar industry. It, it's used in uh, windmills it, as a as a, a graphite plastic composites in, that go into windmills. Even like a like another application would would be the Boeing Dreamliner, um, the new Dreamliner that they're building in Seattle. I live in Vancouver, but their um, their base is obviously down down there in in Seattle, and they're using a graphite composite frame for the new Dreamliner because it's lighter, which means less fuel for the aircraft, stronger, and it it, it um, 
it, it saves on the cost of uh, the expense of fuel. So, I mean, you dig more and more into it, you start to learn more and more about the different applications, and 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 and, uh, and there, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of demand for graphite. Now, um. I just want to give our listeners a basic rundown of some of the supply and demand statistics for the graphite market. Um, can you talk about how the uh, the majority of the supply comes right now from China and also about uh, some of the projected demand statistics for the lithium-ion battery uh, over the next you know, five to ten years or something like that, and talk about the strain that that could put on um, the supply that the Chinese are producing right now. That's great. Yeah, um, graphite. I guess what what the uh, the investors have to understand is graphite is a commodity, but it's not like a commodity like a copper or gold or oil, where all all copper is copper and it's produced all over the world but it it's basically the same and it goes into a big global market at market price whereas um a lot with a lot of these industrial commodities whether it be lithium you know like a tantalum rare earth they're basically made specific for application or for an industry and and the miners have to work with the end users so the, in, in general, broad, broadly, there's two forms of graphite, major forms, which amorphous, which is used more in the steel and automotive and lower value. And then you have flake graphite, which is used in some of these um, um, technologies like the lithium ion battery. And flake graphite um, um, is, is, is very specific for that. And I, right now, China, over the last 10 years, they've become the dominant producer. They control, you know, anywhere between 70 to 80% of the market. And for 10 years, uh, based on blessings of lo location, labor, technology, um, uh, low cost of production, they've gripped control of, of the market. Um, and there's been generally a, a disincentive or no incentive for explorers or developers or mining financiers to look for projects out, out, outside of China. But what you have happening now, now that the market is gradually or has been um, um, gripped by, by, by China, they're putting in um, value added to taxes, export licenses, the, the state and I guess the, the country is taking more of a, a role in consolidating industry and so forth. and Right now, what's that causing it is the price for people to buy graph right, from China outside of China is becoming higher than it is cost. It well, it would cost domestically to buy it in China, and um, that's creating kind of a dynamic where the end users, people that use the product, they have two choices: they either pay a higher price outside of China or have to move their technologies and industries and economic growth in get get the cheap product. That so, sounds very familiar. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Ryan, but that sounds very familiar with what China has done over the last 10 years with the rare earths market as, you know, they flooded the market with cheap supply starting in the early 90s to knock out, you know, all the other producers outside of China, including Molly Korsman Pass. And then after, you know, they had the cheap supply uh, for the rest of the world there, they then are now moving all the value added supply of uh, all the value added downstream production of all the rare earth products and the magnet making is all being moved to China for companies like Apple and others so they can get guaranteed supply. Yeah. Uh, earth, tungsten, graphite, they're, they're all following a, a similar path. I mean, um, definitely the rare earth has got more attention, but it's, it's, it's the same kind of fundamentals or, um, as, as those other commodities. In, 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 my, in my opinion, it's an art of war strategy from China. So China is going to cut off the supply, and then they're going to beat their competitors, which are the producers of the value-added products in the other countries. They're going to beat them by cutting off the supply. <laughs> I, I guess the other, um, the other thing that will likely happen, and it happened in rare earth, where not only are um, – um, the end users and battery manufacturers and uh, the Japanese and, and 
Korean government groups and conglomerates. I've spoken with a, a few of them, and, and they're looking right now, um, working hard to find off off take outside of China or do deals to uh, get off take. And and but the Chinese are going to be doing that as well. They're going to be major players in acquiring off take from um, deposits outside of China. They're going to they're going to or acquiring the companies outright in rare earth. They um, are major. The Chinese are major shareholder of uh, of Linus. They tried to be a major shareholder of Molly Corp. I, I I think it got um, um, yeah they away. yeah the U S regulator stopped that because the China one of the Chinese oil companies did try to buy Unical when Unical owned um, Molly Corp and Mount Pass. Yep, correct. Mm-hmm. So their 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 play is basically uh, a twofold: make the price go up high a little bit or higher outside of China, and also try to acquire positions in some of the more advanced um, um, producers outside. So, I mean, if you're an advanced producer right now that you have the right type of geology and the right type of product, you have a lot of people knocking on your door to do a deal, whether it be the Chinese or a major battery manufacturer. Or, um, um, you, you, have, you have a lot of options available to you. All right. I was actually uh, – that sounds interesting. And I was actually wondering, uh, are you implying that uh, in rare earths, uh, people see China, at least some experts see China as a becoming a net importer of heavy rare earths? Do you expect China to become a net importer of any types of graphite, flake, or morphous? Uh it's hard to it's hard to say. I mean, right right now they have the bulk of the supply and they have a lot of product, of, you know, for their for their own country. But they will be importing from, or they will be looking to do deals for offtake from deposits outside of China. I I, I guess um, one thing that you had mentioned earlier that I forgot to touch on is in in, in terms of the dynamic the supply. De- demand dynamic. Like right now the total graphite market amorphous and flake together is about 1.2 million tons per year. Um, just in raw commodity it's about a two billion dollar um, space uh, and um, but all the in, all the industries are or not all the industries but all the products that are based on the commodity is maybe about a 12 billion dollar space. Well, about 40% of that market is flake graphite. So, say around 500,000 ton per ton per day. And just on the lithium area alone, people are projecting that eight year from now, 2020, that just for that one application alone, it could be 1.6 million ton. So, a triple in amount of graphite that will that will need, um, just based on the Boy. battery alone. I think that might be a little optimistic, but the, if a market will double in an eight-year period, if a major producer is 20,000 ton per year. That's a lot of new projects, a lot of new mines, a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity. Yeah, that sounds like a higher than seven percent demand growth statistic there. Yeah, I I don't know the exact number, but I think it's growing. That well, that market about well well 20 percent. That's it's very wow. impressive. That is. Now, 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 for our listeners, that it's you know with that type of growth though, it could be very painful because as we've seen it in the rare earths market, the rare earths prices went up too fast. There was some demand. There was quite a bit of demand destruction, especially on the light rare earths and the rare earth stocks. There was a very violent correction, and now the rare earths market, like the rare earths companies, there's going to have to be you know forced consolidation. Because, you know, there was over 200 rare earth juniors, and uh, the majority of them are going to fail. I, I'm actually expecting less than 10 rare earth companies to survive in the next few years. I think the consolidation is going to be very painful. Um, now, now, Ryan, I want to transition here a little bit. You touched on talking about some of the guys, some of the producers here who are going to have – the deals approach them for long-term offtake agreement contracts. I wanted to make sure our listeners, because we've had a few of them already ask us when we told them we were going to do this interview with you, we had a few of them ask us specifically uh, to ask you 
about first movers in the graphite space. What are some of the companies like Northern Graphite or Focus Metals that are going into production first? Yep. I mean, uh, right, I think the most advanced uh, deposit, pu publicly traded deposit, um, pure graphite play is, is Northern Graphite. And they have a project in Ontario that has been known and worked for for a long period of time now. But they've completed a 43101 resource. They've completed pilot um, mineral processing. They're about to complete a bankable. We put out a PEA. They're going to put out a bankable um, uh, feasibility. And they're kind of at the position now where they can, or if they, they I imagine they already have begun. Um, talking to some of these potential offtake partners or strategic equity partners, people that would maybe maybe come in and purchase a, a percentage of the company and, and offer to buy a off offtake in the long term. The other thing about Northern Graphite, I guess, is that the management team, they, they're, they're, they're very well experienced in developing mine. They had worked on a gold project in Burkina that got bought out during the construction phase. I think that... Uh, I mean, from the investment side, the the space is so new. There'll be a there'll be a lot of new entrants in the space because there's a lot of opportunity. Just like in uh, uranium, when uranium prices went up, um, a lot of new uranium companies were formed. When rare earth prices go up, rare earth companies were formed. And uh, you know, the Canadian exploration industry or the global exploration industry, it it goes after that and, and, and tries to make new discovery or reevaluate old deposits. But the ones that will be more successful or the most successful, I think, will be the ones that have the team uh, that not only understands the graphite market but has put a mine in production, understands mineral processing is so key in this space. You have to have someone on your team that knows how to take the rock and turn it into the different products that the battery industry will buy. You have to have someone on your team that has worked with end users before, understands the battery market, understands the different applications. So, I mean, Northern Graphite has all that. They have a great project, and they're in a good position, and they're going to have a lot of success um, um, moving forward. Uh, you know, uh, the, the other company that you had mentioned, Focus Metals, they have a project in um, in Quebec that's been around um, longer than I have. Uh, it it uh, it's changed ownership a number of times. It has a 16% grade of 43101. They just came out with a with a um, uh, well, well, with with a compliant resource. Uh, they're doing a lot of work on on the graphene side uh, of the business, or graphene basically is a a product made from carbon that can be used in a whole bunch of applications like uh, superconductors and so forth. And they're kind of trying to trailblaze and op open up some new markets for, for the graphite space. Okay. Uh, one other stock you mentioned, or company you mentioned in your uh, critical medicals interview that you liked was Oricon Resources. Resource Corporation. I was wondering, can you explain uh, uh, what type of deposit that one has, and when these, when it might be going into production? Yeah, um, Oricon. Now, a week ago, they had, uh, they've gone through a name change and a, and a, a ticker change as well. The new name is Standard Graphite, and uh, they, they trade on the venture under SGH. I guess. What I what I see or what I is that the best graphite deposits, the most valuable, the highest grade, the um, um, the most interesting haven't been found because price has been low for so long. Um, there's been basically zero incentive to explore for, um, develop, um, look for new deposits. Most of the deposits that are um, the the early uh, movers. These deposits have been known for 20, 30 years, and they were the easy ones too. They were found from elk crop. They were found near a waterway. They were found by farmers in southern Ontario that hit elk crop in the back of their fields, and then and then the mining company came in there and began to develop them. You know, graphite. If you're in the right geological environment, 
and um, you're, you're using the right tools, you're moving forward quickly, you have the right team, it's pretty easy to make new discoveries or, or um, hope uh, if you have the right ingredients because it's highly, um, it picks up very easy with geophysics, but uh, it'll show up as a, a bright spot because it's so um, um, conducive to, to electricity. And uh, uh, the, I guess the interesting thing, you know, talking to the guys that from the regional geological office in southern Ontario, most of the best terrain for, for graphite has never even been flown, not by the government, not by companies, not, not, by, not, by, not by anyone. And what, what Orican are doing, they have three big ducks that, um, you know, they have known trenching and drilling and um, graphite occurrences, but they cover, cover all the right geology, big, big land packages, and now they've flown. And uh, they got indications that they 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 could be on to um, some some new discoveries. So I mean, there's a lot of leverage when you go from being say a five ten million market cap, and you're trying to catch up with the leaders at say sixty to eighty million market cap. Uh, but that rather than dusting off an old project that's been known, to go after something new and 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 begin from uh, from from the ground floor. That that that's basically what. Uh, what standard graphite is doing, and I think they're doing a good job. Yeah, and I, I think that's some very great insights that you've put uh, into uh, Oricon for us, Ryan. Um, I, I've had one other friend in the resource industry speak very glowingly about Strike as well as a good first mover. He, he really likes Strike's deposits compared to northern graphite's ones because I think he was saying that Strike is planning a much larger graphite mine and it's still large flake and it, I think uh, Strike has even higher grades than northern graphite does. Yeah, yeah. Strike graphite, they're, uh, they're, they're a junior as well and they've acquired a, a project in northern Saskatchewan that had actually been um, worked about 20 years ago for a short period of time by a, a, a graphite um, industry player, Superior Graphite. They're still involved in the industry. They're, they're a big organization. And they were looking at that time for new sources of natural flake or, or graphite supply to feed their um, processing and in, 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 in industry. And they had drilled two areas in, uh, in northern Saskatchewan, Deep Bay East and, and Deep Bay West. And Deep Bay East is owned by uh, private individuals, and they're pushing that towards production. They've been talking with Chinese and, and so forth. Deep Bay West is owned by um, Strike. And there was a lot of, uh, maybe not as much money or as much effort or as much um, um, that, that Strike will be putting into it now, but at that time they had done a metallurgical work or, or mineral processing work. They had... Um, done kind of a back of the envelope feasibility, and they, they drilled four holes onto the strike property. So it, it, it's one of these interesting projects that got looked at for a short period by industry guys, and and now is being reevaluated. And, and projects like that, I think, are uh, are going to be are going to be quite attractive. Um, um, you know, in the new pricing environment, if prices continue to go up. Yeah, and I, I think that's an important point, Ryan, is that as the price continues to go up and you see more of a strain put on demand, uh, more strain put, excuse me, put on supply with increasing demand from the graphite battery, like you were saying, I, I think a lot more juniors are going to come on the market. What does worry me, though, is that I think we will have a boom-bust type of normal commodity market reaction like you mentioned about uranium market, like what happened in reverse. Now, I, I don't think that has happened yet in graphite, so I think as like a speculation for some of these juniors, I think our listeners can put some money to work in some of these juniors and get big pops, but, you know, the, a lot of these companies are going to, you know, they're going to go up a lot in the short term. Uh, as speculations, but you know you got to pull some money off the table, like in the rare earths. If you bought Quest Rare Metals at six cents a share and it went to six dollars, it just wouldn't be prudent to just buy and hold all of the shares you bought at six cents and not sell any that went to six dollars. Yeah, I mean, I mean, right now the market is so new, and there are only a handful of players. If you were to 
if you were to look at a basket of uh, um, you would you, you would potentially do do very well move, moving forward. I I mean it doesn't matter really whether it's gold, um, zinc, you know lead, rare earth, uranium, you name it. If the fundamentals of a space are there and prices are moving higher, the Canadian exploration and finance industry and the global finance and exploration industry will go after uh, after that opportunity to to find new projects to fill the fundamental gap and that that happening it, it's going to continue to happen in in the graphite space i mean a lot of people forget that the uranium market was a two dollar market when it really took off in uh, or started to take off in 2004 so i i think you know there's early um movers there's companies that are in a position now to do deals like the northern graphite or focus with end users and then there'll be a new entrance as well. Um, you uh, you got to pick your timing and you got to pick your um, spot spots, right? But a lot of a lot of big companies were built in the uranium space, um, dual listed companies, a lot of M&A activity. And it started in 2004, but it was in t it wasn't until 2006 all the way to 2008. And people are still. I mean, there's been some nice discoveries in, in, in uranium and, and people are still trying to find uh, new sources of supply to fill the fundamental demand there as well. So I, I, I see a bright future for the space and I think it's still very early. Yeah, I agree with you on the long-term fundamentals, um, Ryan, and we're, we didn't even cover graphene in this interview, which I, I think longer term over the next 10 years, because right now there's no commercial products on the market that are actually using graphene, but I think on top of everything else bullish we just said for graphite, I think graphene has a humongous potential to put a strain on supply for graphite. So in, in um, wrapping things up here, Ryan, I just want to thank you very much for your time and for giving our listeners a nice summary of the graphite market. And uh, we look forward to having you back um, on a Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview in the future. And um, can you tell our listeners, please, where they can find some of your work and some of your articles if they want to um, look up some of the, your other insights on uh, graph, the graphite market? Yeah, I, I well, I'm a director in a corporate development for Zintu, and we put a lot of uh, attention for about two years on the space. So you can have a look at what we've been doing there on uh, www.zintu.com. And about a week ago, I, I was interviewed by um, the, the critical uh, metal report, and I, I think you can get it on uh, um, the aureport.com or the gold report. And and um, yeah, I, I thank you guys for the opportunity, and it, 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 it's it's a good space. Pick your spots wisely. It's it's early, and uh, and ho hopefully investors or listeners can do well. <laughs>